Uh, welcome to Capture at This Week. I'm Will Woodall, joined as always by Mike Rary. Hey, Mike. Hey, Will. Uh, it was great. Uh, great golf tournament yesterday. I don't know if you caught the end of that. Uh, uh, Rory won. Yeah, I didn't know like what time hole. to watch it, and then yeah. it kept getting replayed. And I ended up watching the third round, which was like <laughs> I really messed it up. It was quite exciting. It looked like he was going to lose it, and then uh, birdied 17 and 18. So nice. Very good. Very good outcome for him. Winning uh, in his uh, hometown or his home on home soil, I guess. Yeah. Um, let's get into the updates for the week. We're going to talk about equity markets. The market just keeps going up. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and what the fundamentals suggest because fundamentals would suggest the market should not keep going up, but you know the market can can continue to go up for a while if uh, the fundamentals are worsening so uh, let's we'll talk we'll dig into that in some depth uh, we'll update give you an update on a recession signal which we've made a lot of progress on and um, we'll talk about uh, what we're seeing in the upcoming week from the Fed and other data sources so let's start the week with a look at the equity returns once again a hot week yeah large caps up over two percent large growth stocks leading the way um, also seeing small caps continue to rally. So they basically were flat heading into the month of June uh, on a year-to-date basis, small caps, and then subsequently rallied in June and have continued to rally here recently. Um, started to see much more participation in terms of equity inflows into small caps, mm-hmm. retail inflows in particular. You know, after uh, the first six months or so of the year, five months of the year where all of the returns were concentrated in just a handful of stocks. Mm-hmm. It was tough to say exactly what was going to happen, but there could definitely be FOMO chasing, and it seems like there's definitely uh, some FOMO chasing. There's some of that. There's also been a lot of short covering. Uh, a lot of the most shorted stocks uh, were covered last week in particular. Yeah. So that's been dry. That drove up a lot of the smaller names that we see in this uh, in this chart here, but. Short covering has been a big thing. A lot of hedge funds have had to take down their books and their gross exposure. So yeah. uh, saw a lot of covering there. Let's look at fixed income returns. Yeah, because, you know, speaking of short covering, um, hedge funds had built up very large short positions across the Treasury yield curve, betting that rates would con- continue to go higher. And then last week with the June inflation figures coming in, cooler than expected, just a touch cooler than expected. And you combine that with, you know, the the June jobs report, the first uh, non-farm payrolls report coming in weaker than expected in a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. A lot of those shorts had to get covered. And you saw a rally across the Treasury yield curve. See the 30-year total return on a 30-year bond last week. uh, You made 2.2%. So, Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, in the L space, another great week there also. Yeah, seeing a rally across the commodity space, a lot of this is predicated on hope that the situ- the economic recovery in China um, is going to start to accelerate or going to start to materialize. A lot of new stimulus measures are being, being enacted right now. It's mm-hmm. difficult to say whether they're the right ones or they're going to make any difference, yeah. um, especially if it turns out China's in the beginning of a balance sheet recession similar to what Japan went through. Yeah. But, you know, the commodity market can trade on whatever it wants. So Yeah, I mean, it seems like that's, for China, that's the, the path they're following. It's the Japan sort of model and... The data just keeps getting uglier and uglier over there. Yeah. So we'll have to mm-hmm. see how that plays itself out. Let's look at the actual equity market returns, the index returns, and um, sort of it's like deja vu all over again a little bit. Like let's dial back to when we were at the market highs yeah. and uh, where where we are today. Yeah, definitely. So you know, back here at the beginning of 2022, the S and P was almost at 4,800. And we obviously know what happened over the next um, nine months and some change fell all the way down to 3,500. And then since then um, has been rallying and we're back up around 4,500 mm-hmm. on the S&P. So you think the last time we were at these levels was when we were at these near these all-time highs. But so much has happened fundamentally since then. We've right. gone through so much 
that it's difficult to say that this 4500 is justified if you thought this 4800 was justified. Right. You know? Yeah. So one of these things doesn't make sense. I mean, so you just sort of go down the line here. Back in early 2020, uh, 2022, um, you know, the Fed funds rate was at 0.25%. And now we're at five and a quarter. Right. And we're likely to get one more rate hike next week. So, and then who knows, least, maybe they'll right. stop there. But you look at the Fed funds, the Fed funds rate going up 5% over that period of time, second fastest rate hike cycle in history. And what that, do, what that should do is reset valuations across all asset classes. So if you just look at the S&P 500 relative to earnings, back when we were at all-time highs, it was trading at 19.2 times forward earnings. Right. You know, an earnings yield of 5.21. Now it's trading at 18.9 times forward earnings. So just as expensive, but relative to cash, way more expensive. Way more expensive. Way more expensive. Um, and then you look at some of the other fundamentals. Well, you know, when we were back at all-time highs, liquidity was robust on a broad basis in terms of money supply growth, but then also net liquidity was very robust. Mm -hmm. So it made sense that stocks would just keep going higher. There's just too much money um, around. Inflation was at five and a half back then. It's come down a little bit, but not a whole lot. It's now it's at 4.9% core CPI year over year. So more progress needs to be made there. And then economic momentum has slowed a lot. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the economic data has been better than expected here year to date. But real GDP year over year, no doubt, the economy is slowing 1.8% um, year over year now. We were in the fives back then. Right. So very different fundamental picture suggests 4,500 does not seem fundamentally correct, you know, but the market reserves the right to not trade on fundamentals whenever it wants. Yeah. I guess the question the market's answering or telling us is they're seeing that there's going to be significant improvement in these numbers, mm -hmm. which yeah. that, that's, that's what's driving these, val these prices today is even though these factors are here, the, the market's suggesting potentially that we're out of the woods, perhaps, that the worst is over, these numbers are going to reverse, mm -hmm. and so they're betting on that. So give give us context on these today numbers and how they're trending. Yeah, so take them one by one. So the forward earnings yield, that is a forward-looking number. That's based on 12-month forward earnings, and those are going sideways. And Q2 earnings season is supposed to be down 7% year over year. Yeah. We'll see if everybody beats and they start raising expectations, then maybe stocks get cheaper based on earnings. But, you know, we need more than just that, right? Um, M2 year over year, right now we may be at the low, but, you know, we forecast M2 12 months out, we see returning to something like 0% year over year over the next 12 months. So that's not a big improvement. Core CPI over the next 12 months, we see it getting below 4, but still well above the Fed's target. So improvement, yes, but still not out of the woods. And then real GDP growth, we actually see slowing from here. Um, and, you know, that's pretty much consensus as well. So, yes, the market is expecting improvement in these data points over the next 12 months, but nowhere near enough improvement to justify valuations like we saw at all-time highs when you can get a risk-free five and a quarter yeah. investing in cash. Right. Yeah, and I think the other important point is 12 months is a long time. Mm -hmm. So the damage that this number is going to do to the real economy in the next 12 months, yeah, um, in terms of refinancing capital and, and, and other types of business issues, like how does that how does the Fed funds rate staying at five or five and a quarter or five yeah. and a half for the next 12 months impact business earnings? Yeah, definitely. Well. So very timely, the Fed actually recently put out a new research paper which tracks the percentage of companies in the U.S. that are in financial distress because that is the primary method by which the Fed funds rate translates into the real economy, hmm. restrictive monetary policy. And what it basically shows is that we have the fastest increase in percentage of companies in financial distress that we've ever seen. It's something like 37%. Mm -hmm. That's typical with recessions. And every single day that the Fed leaves the Fed funds rate in restrictive territory, 
that is going to make it harder and harder for those firms to get out of financial distress. They have fewer options at their disposal. So, you know, the longer they keep the Fed funds rate where it's at, it's just going to have a more substantial negative impact on these companies' ability to get out of financial distress. Mm -hmm. And what do they have to do? They have to lay off employees. They have to cut spending, et cetera. And that all flows into the real economy. Um, the other thing to note here is even if the Fed stops hiking, you're now in a sort of a passive tightening scenario where if economic growth keeps slowing and the Fed keeps the Fed funds rate where it's at, well, then in essence, the Fed funds rate is getting tighter or more restrictive every single day. Yeah, that's important. And so that's happening right now as well. And how does that sort of translate into this this YOLO behavior we're seeing sort of since 4,000. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, eventually, you gotta, I mean, eventually, you got to pay the bill, right? I mean, right. it's just a matter of time. Yeah. And without, without having the crystal ball, 5.5% rates for the next year aren't good for any investor. Right, right. Unless I mean, you're in cash. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think, so I think what you're, what you're speaking to is it's a key decision point now for investors because the equity risk premium is now negative. Right. Right. The forward earnings yield on stocks is below what you can get on a risk-free asset. Yes. So what are you to do? What looks good in these scenarios? Why does this happen? You know, and that's something we can dig into. And let's look at the equity risk premium because I mean, basically I can sit here today and say, all that stuff we just talked about, I can avoid all that and just get five and a half percent in a treasury bond right. for the next year. Yep. Yep. No risk. Yeah. It's very attractive. Why why, <laughs> why not do that? Right? Why not do that? Yeah. So, you know, we look at the equity risk premium. Once again, what that is, you take the forward earnings yield on stocks, you subtract out the treasury bill yield, equity risk premium, you should get paid more or expect to get paid more to own a basket of risky security stocks than you do a risk-free asset. Yeah. So when the equity risk premium is positive, then it's Tina, Tina, Tina. You just stay invested in equities. You should earn more money over the long term. When it flips negative, that's a problem. Now you get paid more on the risk-free asset. So it, it doesn't happen that often. You know, if we look at the board here, yeah. it happened certainly before the tech bubble burst. It got substantially negative. It happened just after 1980, and that was when Paul Volcker was aggressively raising the Fed funds rate in order to try to break the back of inflation, and that got a little out of hand. And then it happened late in the 60s as well, and part of that was stocks were getting, were getting very expensive. Right. And so if you want to have a reasonable expectation going forward, you know, when the equity risk premium is negative, what should I expect in terms of returns over the next one year, three year five years, well, on average, the S&P generates a positive return over those time, time horizons when the equity risk premium is negative. The important thing is there's a big negative left tail. So some of the worst equity market environments in history happen when the equity risk premium is negative, Right. particularly coming out of the tech bubble burst, right? Um, but more importantly, you don't get any additional return versus cash. Cash usually outperforms. And then finally, long-term bonds are one of the most attractive asset classes to own when the equity risk premium goes negative because you're usually at a point where the Fed has just raised the Fed funds rate aggressively. That's why the cash yield is so high. You may be towards the end of an economic cycle because the Fed just raised the Fed funds rate so aggressively. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're doing this to try to defeat inflation. And where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck if inflation is defeated is long-term bonds. Okay. So long-term government bonds, on average, will get you 8%, you know, if you were to add to them when the equity risk premium is negative. Right. So. Yeah. And, and in terms of, I think, when we talk about the investor, who, who are we talking about who would be making these decisions to say, I will buy cash, I'll, I'll buy it into a cash asset versus buying it into the yeah. equity market? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's obviously institutions, it's hedge funds, it's retail. Usually, when things get wacky like this, you think about tech bubble, towards the end of a market cycle, it's retail 
type investor flows that are really pushing equities higher when you can get a risk-free, uh, competitive risk-free return on cash. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they'll get there, but yeah. But a, lo a lot of investors like pension funds and, and large institutional funds have to follow an asset allocation. So mm -hmm. they're still dumping money into equities, even if it's not the right thing to do immediately because they have to stay within their policy constraints. Yeah, that's fair. Yep. And a lot of people, retail investors in 401k plans are sort of on this automatic set it and forget it. So they're just dumping money in every paycheck. Mm -hmm. And so they would have to take action, which we know doesn't happen very much yeah. in those plans. So um, usually the transmission mechanism there would be an increase in unemployment. Yeah. That's right, what it is. and that would sort of break the cycle on that. Yeah. So, until we see that type of thing, it's going to be hard to shut off those automatic flows. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's give an update on the framework. Mm -hmm. Start with inflation. Yeah. So the inflation numbers that came out last week, they were a touch cooler than expected. So if you look at headline CPI now down right around three percent on a year-over-year -year basis, you see that solid dark blue line. If you look at our forecasts, however, over the next 12 months, um, starting with headline, sort of the, the easy part of the disinflation is over. And we really see headline CPI going sideways from here on out. And a couple reasons for that. One is you see core still running hot, light blue. So core makes up 70% of headline, you know. So we see core coming down to headline. But two, um, the base effects, mm -hmm. things like food and energy prices, coming off of the really easy year-over-year -year disinflationary comps from last spring post uh, Russia invading Ukraine. You know, you saw WTI crude at 120, right. right? So if WTI crude today is at 70, that's a huge disinflationary impact year-over-year. -year. Absolutely. Now WTI crude has come back up around 80, and we're starting to compare it over numbers like 90, 100. So it's going to be harder and harder to see disinflation from the food and energy prices. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we see that with, with sort of the sticky elements of core. Uh, those combined, we see headline inflation going sideways. So the easy part is over. Um, now will be the hard part. Uh, I know everybody's been saying that for a long time, but, um, you know, you look at how much headline has come down since it peaked last, last fall. It's a very aggressive disinflationary time period, and it's going to be more and more frustrating now if the economic data is better than expected and inflation stays in the threes with no progress. That's going to be really tough for the Fed. Right. right. Yeah. Which means more rate hikes or no rate hikes and definitely no cuts. Right, right. Let's look at super core. We added super core to the data set here. Yep. So yeah, super core inflation. This is exactly what the Fed's focused on. You take the core basket, you subtract out housing. Um, I'm sorry, you look, take the core basket, you look at services, you subtract out housing. It's running at 4% year over year. So this is the type of stuff that the Fed is worried about. A different way to look at this, you know, the Cleveland Fed takes the entire CPI basket and they break it out into flexible versus sticky. Hmm. The flexible stuff has come down. That's food, energy, car prices, apparel, goods, stuff like that. The sticky stuff is not coming down fast enough. And the sticky stuff is much more related to wages, which is why the Fed would feel uh, the necessity to keep the Fed funds rate higher for longer, mm -hmm. to try to soften the labor market so the sticky stuff can come down. Yeah. So. It is, is two per, what's the, the natural level of super core? Yeah, it's right around 2% right as well. Two. Yeah. yeah. So trying to get it down. All right, liquidity. Liquidity, not seeing much improvement here. What we have within our forecasts, a continued $95 billion per month decrease of the Fed's balance sheet. Um, and then also in terms of the Fed funds rate, what we have built into here is one more hike. And then basically keeping the Fed funds rate at those levels for the next year. So not a tremendous improvement, but, you know, we think very reasonable assumptions go into that forecast. Yeah. All right. And uh, that obviously impacts net liquidity, which continues yeah. to 
decelerate. Yeah, net liquidity has come back down towards the lows from last fall and should continue to come down as the Fed continues to reduce the size of its balance sheet. Okay. Let's look at uh, economic growth. And economic growth, so Q2 real GDP, the advance estimate is going to come out next week. Um, GDP now type forecasts show that should be somewhere around 2%, mm -hmm. which is much better than expected, primarily because of consumption um, as well as housing flipping from a negative to sort of a non-contributor with housing starts coming back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So that's the little hump in our forecast horizon that you see. Um, and then we've also tacked another quarter on the front end of our forecast. I'm sorry, the back end of our forecast here, uh, Q2 2024. What it basically looks like is Q3 is setting up to be flat. Q4 is, is expected to be negative. And then Q1 and Q2 of next year should be slightly positive. Sure. So it'll be a bumpy ride for sure. And it'll change a lot. Um, but overall, we're still looking at a very slow growth environment. I mean, we're not even sniffing high. Yeah. You know, we're not even coming close to the gray line, which would be high economic growth. Yeah. And we're really not coming close to sort of the normalized levels post COVID, which we're running, you know, in the two and a half, three percent type range. Right. So. Okay. And we'll see how that play, plays out over the course of the next 12 months. Yep. Given current rates. And then uh, we've been doing a lot of work on our recession signal. So we're going to give it just a brief update, but we're going to do a separate video, dive into all the work we've done here because it's super important in terms of our forecasting, whether the recession signal is active or not, because right. it definitely tells us from an investment standpoint, how we should be allocating capital yep. um, or front running, how we should be uh, be allocating capital for clients. So right. let's take a look at the recession signal and talk briefly about the updates. Yeah, and, and I'm sure many viewers are used to us speaking to recession probability. And you know what that basically showed was over a 50% chance of a recession in the next six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. And you know that's still what this is saying. This is saying it in a much different way. That's sort of uh, more succinct, more explicit in terms of timing. Um, and this, instead of a probability type model, it's a signal based model, it's a diffusion based model. So basically what we've narrowed down here is there are four underlying signals within our broad recession signal. First, you have the yield curve, the smartest economy, economist in the room. Um, when that gets inverted, you know, the long term and the near term, when those things both get inverted, that leads every recession by about six months. That is active. So that signal is active. So the yield curve is inverted to the point where a recession should come basically imminently. Um, the next one that we typically see after the yield curve inverts is the real economy. So if you look at things that are great leading indicators of real economic activity, they're very cyclical, things like housing starts, heavy truck sales, new orders to inventory. When those have significant drawdowns or they, they become recessionary, you know, new orders to inventory when that dips below one, that usually leads the economy by about three months. Right. So every time two out of the three of the, anytime two out of three of those have broken down and that signal is activated, a recession is followed usually in three months. That actually was active um, from, right. from March through July, right. the real economy signal was active. So we were in a position where, you know, back half of June, real economy was active and the yield curve signal was active. Mm -hmm. We spoke about this being a period of vulnerability. Um, for the real economy. What's subsequently happened is the yield curve hasn't budged, but a few of these data points in, within the real ec economy signal have rebounded, mainly housing starts. Right. Um, so that's sort of taken the signal sort of off the, off the brink, if you will, to deactivated that signal. Um, then the next thing we typically see transpire is the labor market. So we've spoken to our labor market signal previously. It's based on initial and continuing jobless claims, increases from, from the 52-week low not active currently, and that those that's a coincident indicator. So when we see that big rise in jobless claims, it typically means we're in a recession right now. And then finally, you see market stress. Market stress is kind of a wild card. You can have market stress before a recession. You can have market stress after a recession or during a recession. <laughs> um, but it typically does happen. So we look at stresses in equity markets, credit markets, commodities, and interbank lending. And basically, of these four signals, if you get two out of four active, the entire signal goes active. 
Um, and so we show that on the next slide, you see sort of a stacked bar, bar chart. And you start to stack these things up. Once two out of those four underlying signals are active, a recession has transpired every single time. Um, and so it, uh, it gives us a very succinct, explicit marker as to whether or not the U.S. economy is in, re is in recession. And so right now we're, are, we're showing... Right now we're at one. one. We're just at the yield curve. Uh, we had two active for a little bit there. You know, real economy deactivated, if you will. So now we're just at one. Um, you know, this has happened before. If you look at, for example, in the 90s, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, if you look at before most recessions, it can be volatile. And, you know, one triggering, deactivating, triggering, because we're getting near those threshold mm -hmm. levels and sometimes we're volatile around them. Right. So, you know, just because this right now is not active does not mean that it can't activate just with a couple yeah. bad data reports, right? We're very close on the labor market front. Right. You know, we're very close still on the real economy side, and obviously the yield curve is just extremely inverted. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and it will be probably for a while. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, obviously, as I said, we'll do a, a deeper dive on these signals to give you some background on why we develop them and how we develop them and how we're monitoring them. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the meantime, uh, I think that's it for the week. Yeah. Um, We'll be here uh, next week, back with, uh, I think the Fed meets next week. Yep. Right? So we'll be back with a recap on that and update on markets. Until then, if you have any questions, reach out to us or contact anyone on the private wealth team. Have a great week. Mm -hmm.